Flying Life Podcast, episode 29, recorded on October 24th, 2017. Welcome to the Flying Life Podcast, a podcast about just that, flying, aviation, my life. I'm Dispatcher Mike, a dispatcher for a major airline based here in the United States. Joining me again on this podcast, Dispatcher Greg, another dispatcher for a different major airline based here in the United States. Greg, how's it going? What's going Hello. on? Hello. Hey, oh, Dispatcher Mike. Hey, uh, it's cold. It's cold here in Chicago. It's rainy. It's about to snow <laughs> snow, <laughs> or it feels like it's about to snow <laughs> um, like that yeah. little four little letter word that starts with an s that's yes. got the white yes. frozen a little, stuff little co- white coming down dandruff looking stuff you know that accumulates on the ground uh it, yeah is the city shut down <laughs> not yet have you gone out and bought bread and milk and eggs um, you know what? That's on my to-do list tonight because you know what? <laughs> They'll probably shut down the city tomorrow. That's pretty much how it rolls down here in Atlanta. If that <laughs> stuff's in the forecast, then uh, it's French toast week right? in the uh, in, in people's houses because bread, milk, and eggs are the first things to go away. Yeah. And I need to get my snow tires on my car because, you know, can't drive in Chicago without snow tires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people here in Atlanta can't drive uh, without rain tires. Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right. On this episode, uh, we're going to cover some news and the topic we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about aviation weather, uh, meteorologists, and um, what we use to, uh, tools we use to plan uh plan our uh flights that's flights. what we plan yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. those things you know things, things that carry people things with two engines and wings you know you know to or, me it's still like oh it's almost like a video game you know i'm just seeing like bars and lines when i go to work and i actually see payload counts or anything like that something goes yeah. wrong so All right. you know what i miss i miss working actually at the airport we actually smell the jet fumes you feel Ooh. like you're working for an airline when you smell the jet fumes i miss that because where I yeah. work, we don't smell jet fumes. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we get that when we're outside and the wind's out of the south. It kind of just wafts over to yeah. us. That that smells pretty good. Um, that works great. But uh, I'm also glad they also put us somewhere where the people don't know where we are. That's true. Because I'm the guy that cancels your flight. And trust me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy that pisses a hundred. Imagine if they off. find you, be like, hey, why you cancel down. my flight? Why? I angry at you. you. How dare you? Dare you. All righty. Let's start with the news. Let's go. All right. Our first news story uh, and story comes from uh, Twitter. And it's a little continuation from our last podcast. And uh, this comes from Captain Dave on Twitter. Captain Dave Walsworth is, uh, he's one of the British Airways pilots uh, that um, they allow to post stuff on Twitter. Like he's like one of the official BA pilots for Twitter. Um, Captain Dave is an A380 captain for those uh, British Airways people. And uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. But in the last, uh, uh, last episode, we talked about how we didn't think they'd actually, you know, leave goose bay on three engines they actually had to hang an engine out there on the one that um blew the fan flan, fan blade over there uh on that air france a380 and so they ha- kind of hung a d- dummy engine and they uh three engine ferried uh the airplane uh back to back to france and you know it's kind of kind of dumb on me because i've done that before i mean I've set up and I've been a part of three engine ferries before 
because it was quicker because at, at one time we had lost uh lost an engine on the 747 down in down in manila and it was going to take like two and a half days to get an engine down to uh down to manila to then 48 uh, 24 hours to hang an engine bring and bring it back it was quicker to actually move the airplane on three engines and move a management pilot to the airplane and rest them than it was to actually move in uh, move an engine and hang it so we've done three engine ferries before it hacked me so I, I don't know why last week it kind of was like oh why in the heck would they do that but i didn't know airbuses could do that because i figured it put a whole bunch of codes and things and they'd say stop we can't do that yeah some sort of regulation or something that would say hey you can't do that but apparently they can <laughs> yeah I, I you know we've done it before i mean it, it's it's a ferry permit yeah, and they're four I mean, engines so you know maintenance ferry it away yeah so reading um, that ar- so reading that article it, it has certain regulations or restrictions on them I mean, like with the e tops and all that kind of stuff so it's still kind of yeah, reading it, this correctly, still following whatever regulations that are required for that, you know? Yeah. And, and reading it too is uh, he basically took a note in is an iPhone post on Twitter. So I'm so glad uh, captain Dave did that. Yeah. Um, but it could be taken, carried out on a dry or wet runway, but not contaminated, you know, contaminated being any, any of that four letter word stuff on there, snow, slush or standing water. And uh, max crosswind is 10 knots. I mean, which is, pretty much okay sounds yeah. good and toga thrust on the other three engines and uh away they go and they yeah they obviously fly uh fly a little bit slower um on the way over because obviously they can't do full speed and they fly a little bit lower uh he goes and says recommended speeds are 250 knots below 10,000 and yeah. 300 knots above 10k until Mach 0.79 and then cruise at 79 all the way over so and you always burn more fuel because you're obviously at a lower altitude and all that um does your flight planning systems have a uh a, a one less engine uh way to calculate things there is somewhere in the bowels of our flight planning system a way to do it um i've never actually had a flight plan a ferry with that scenario so i but I've been told that there is a way to calculate it. I still think there's a manual intervention that you have to go in there and calculate certain things from what I understand. Uh, for, for us, on, mm, I'm pretty sure it's all the fleets now. It's just a drop-down menu, and you just go uh, uh, one less engine. At least that's where yeah. it was at my previous airline before we got purchased slash merged with my current airline. There was a, there was a one less engine. And I think almost all of the uh, fleets now have a, a gear down drop box, which are pretty much the two, um, a gear down flight ferry flight will happen more often than the one without an engine. But, you know, it's kind of nice for the computer to just say, all right, fine. You're just going to calculate gear down, but compute. A lot yeah, than us. I, 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 I can tell you 99% for sure that there is no drop down <laughs> on the system that we use. Um, yeah, if there is, a fe- <laughs> if there is a feature of such thing, um, you probably have to hunt and peck for it or get <laughs> one of the IT people involved to figure out how to do it. But I'm, I'm fairly confident. Yeah, there's no drop down, and you have to manually do something. It's just, everything is a manual. We might as well bust out the whiz wheels half the time <laughs> with our system. I'm telling you. <laughs> you mean you guys don't have like it's just a nice little GUI where you can just kind of plug things in, hit the compute button, then the send button, and send it away? Well, yeah, there's some, you know, like yes and no, email. but <laughs> you know, if like the MEL says add point two percent to the burn there's yes. no little box no. where you just go point two yeah so there so with mel application it's most mel's it will automatically calculate burn and all the kind of penalties that have apply but in this particular scenario there is no like stored mel in there that you have to that would automatically take care of that 
most of our meals are pretty much automatic. If it's on there, it goes through and put it and automatically puts all of that into the flight planning system. Yeah. I mean, I, is... I, 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 yeah. And that's good. I, I would say probably 99% of our MELs are boom. Once they're in the system, it automatically calculates everything and you don't have to worry about checking anything. It's just there. Um, but there are certain things that come across every now and then that you do have to like, okay, you have to calculate an added burn manually and add it to your CF or, Wow. Or, yeah. Manually. Um, you mean manually. you actually have to use your brain and a calculator? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. You know, I haven't no. done that since my, like, I don't know, dispatch uh, practical exam. And and God forbid it's before my first cup of coffee in the morning. Oh, boy. I'd, I'd if actually. That's my extra... first release. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 extra pounds. You're covered. Yeah. Oh, I, I always love the uh, boost pump fuel scenarios. Like, so we have to manually, if you got a uh, in-op boost pump, and if you have any fuel in the center tank, you have to add that to your zero fuel weight to protect the payload. Well, our system doesn't automatically do that. So you got to go in there. <laughs> what is your payload? What is the fuel in the center tank? You know, does it exceed your maximum structural fuel weight? If it does, then you got to manually go in there and restrict your max takeoff weight. Wow. Yeah. So it. It could be. You guys work harder. Over yeah. There at Acme North. Apparently. Yeah, you guys. Like I said, harder. it can't be, be. It cannot be before my first cup of coffee in the morning. Absolutely not. Refuse. Mm. See, that's why I don't work day shift. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Moving on to our next story. Another kind of continuation from uh, last week's podcast. Last week, uh, we talked about uh, the United States government putting a three hundred percent tariff on the Bombardier C-Series jets that uh, Delta Airlines uh, was hoping to buy. And uh, that was after Boeing claimed that it was unfair practices. Um, about 10 days or five days after that announcement by the U.S. government, this announcement came out, and this is a press release from uh, Airbus. And it says... Uh, uh, dated 16th of October, 2017, Airbus and Bombardier announced C-Series partnership and some of the partnership uh, highlights of this partnership is that uh, Airbus is going to acquire a majority stake in the C-Series Aircraft Limited Partnership. And while the C-Series itself is actually not made by Bombardier itself, it's made by a partnership between Bombardier and the Quebec government. And now Airbus just bought 50.1% 50, 50 of that company. So that partnership is going to bring together two complementary product lines. This is, again, from the press release uh, with a 100 to 150 seat market segment and then a, which is expected to represent more than 6,000 new aircraft over the next 20 years. And the, the big thing of this partnership, what I see is that it's going to upgrade the Quebec assembly line in, for the C-Series, but it is also going to add a second assembly line in anywhere else but the united states and uh in mobile alabama where yeah. airbus already makes uh makes the e3 19s and 20s and 21s the e320 family so if you make the airplane in the united states you pretty much can't put an import tax on it because well you made it here boom <laughs> <laughs> so um Let's find a, a loop in the uh in the process there right and you know it's a loop in the process and very out of the box thinking by mm -hmm. um, bombardier and very smart by airbus because their a319 uh a319 max sales have been um somewhere around the range of non-existent and so it's good for them and obviously they see the the quality of the bombardier product that they uh that they went through and uh and they designed it. It's a, a great airplane on paper. And uh, I haven't actually had to play with it. I uh, got to play with it in the flight planning system yet. And uh, so it's good for them. And this then also is opening up for Airbus for uh, selling some military jets to the Canadians. So all in all, Boeing, uh, Boeing might have hosed themselves very, very, very much in yeah, this, whole, yeah. this whole deal. So who's the, the biggest 
buyer of these C series? Is it Delta, Delta. or is Delta? Delta is Delta is currently the biggest buyer. Um, the aircraft's been in commercial operation for over a year, and I believe Swiss Air, uh, Swiss Air and Air Baltic are some other carriers that that fly the airplane. But, but no one no, that you know of anyone else domestically, right? Other than uh, there are no other U.S. carriers that have uh, purchased the aircraft. Okay. Well, that may change, right? It may change, especially now this that, and then uh, then all all of that. So, but you know. Those yeah, they're, uh, nice. they're nice airplanes, 100, 150 seat. Up to, Airplane. I think, up uh, to 150 seat seats. Yeah. yeah, I think those, I think those guys over there at Delta, I think, are put like 100, 109, 110, somewhere in that in there. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's almost like a DC 9 30. And we all know and how successful that airplane was. What is that going to replace? Is that going to the MDs or is it? I believe Delta is planning on replacing the regional jets. Oh, those. okay. Okay. And scrapping some RJs and bringing some flying uh, to the mainline side. Very cool. All right. You haven't had to deal with this yet, Greg, but this uh, this next uh, news article, uh, this comes from the Flight Service Bureau, which is, uh, which is a very interesting company. And what they do is they send newsletters and you can subscribe to their bulletins about different um, different international uh, situations that go uh, going around the world that would affect pretty much the dispatch side of things or the airline operations uh, side of things. Um, I don't subscribe to this group. They still send me emails anyway. But uh, if I was a back office guy or a guy that was working at a, a smaller airline that didn't have the big reach like Acme does, uh, I'm pretty sure I'd be all over it. But, uh, this uh, this article is an iridium fault prompts a ban by Oceanic ATC, and this is uh, operators, uh, basically governments of Chile, Japan, uh, Anchorage Center, Oakland Center, New York Center, and I really want to think a couple other centers jumped on over that, and basically said if you use the iridium um, satellite company as your provide, provider for CPDLC, therefore you're not allowed to use CPDLC in the, their airspace. And this really comes back and stems from a situation where, uh, looking through it here, on September 12th, an Alaskan Airlines flight had a failure of their uh, CMU, which is their comms management unit, that caused their iridium connection to stop. An ATC message was sent to that aircraft, but it was not delivered. On that aircraft's next flight, the CMU was reset and the issue was corrected, and the pending message was then delivered. The CMU did not recognize that the message was being old, so it presented it to the flight crew, flight crew as a flight uh, a message coming from ATC. And uh, FSB understands, or Flight Service Bureau understands that that aircraft took the climb instruction, and then climbed a 1,000 feet. And then on another flight operated by Hawaiian Airlines out of Oakland had a similar problem. This aircraft had both Iridium and Immersat on board, and during the flight, the flight switched over to Immersat as its, presider, as it's the provider opposed to Iridium. And the Iridium, you know, it's the same thing. The Iridium system sent up an old message and the crew queried and then realized that they should not, they should just disregard that message. It, it basically stems to, to a problem on the Iridium side where uh, Iridium themselves are, um, there's no um, stopgap. There's no, there's no quality control in the messages in there. So in their system, it would always continue to keep sending that same message to that same aircraft. And there was no timeout feature to that message. So in the end, um, they were sending up bogus messages up to airplanes on CPDLC. And CPDLC would be cockpit controller data link, where it's basically uses the ACAR system between a controller on the ground, mainly 
here domestically in the United States being a oceanic controller. There are some centers over in Europe that uh, still you that have transitioned to a CPDLC. I know Shannon has done that, um, where they use CPDLC, but it's mainly in in route um, operation. They use CPDLC. So bad yeah. juju for those guys that. Yeah, that sounds really... pretty uh, dangerous. Actually, getting delayed messages. You would think that there would be a some kind of function that after some point in time it would time out and just reject or you know so that doesn't delay right. 24 or 36 hours later i mean that's right a problem. There, there was no there was no reject i know acars yeah. has a reject feature yeah and, and i've gotten that before i'm sure you has dispatching yep. that you try to send something up and the acars are rejected back and you get a message back to you on yep. your desk and saying this message has rejected try sending again Yep. Or something like that. And it always seems to happen when we need to notify the crews of something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? happens. But I, I mean, we have, at least on the domestic side, we use CPDLC out of certain stations. Um, I know Newark and San Francisco for domestic flights to um, get their clearance information. And they, you know, they get every, so if there's a reroute or whatever, or whatnot, they'll be able to, <clears throat> excuse me, reload the reroute right from CPDLC, which is very helpful for the crews. Um, but, I, you know, I've never seen a situation, at least domestically, you know, where they've timed out or whatnot. So, yeah, that, that you know, that is, uh, that is something, um, you know, to me, that CPDLC in airports and clearance delivery to me is a lot like just the, the digital, the the digital, um, not D eight is, but uh, I mean, over at Acme, we've been getting crews have been getting, uh, crews have been getting their clearances via A cars, uh, for a long time. And now they yeah. kind of put that CPDLC tag mm -hmm. on it. It's supposed to be all funky and new, but you can't really tell the difference. So and what's I mean, nice is dispatchers now get the copy of the CPDLC, whereas before, before when they used to get it, if there was a route change, we would never see it. See, we always did. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, always, we, we always got a route change every time they, they got something. If they, if they got their A cars and they sent a clearance uh, and the clearance had changed, we would get a message and dispatch that their clearance had changed. So see, that's nice. Yeah. For us, obviously, nothing has changed for you guys uh, better than sliced bread, obviously. Well, yeah. I mean, it's helpful one just to see the right. If there's, if there's a station that doesn't have CPDLC in a flight, gets a reroute. It's on the, you have no clue. Uh, it's up to the pilot to tell us, Hey, by the way, here's my new route. Or if you happen to be checking in your ASC to see, right. Oh, by the way, did he get a new route? Then you might be able to see it ahead of time, but you know, most of the time yeah. it's up to the crew. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about weather and ASDs yeah. and things like yeah. that. Because our ASD does that same thing too. All right, so that's that. Um, next story. Uh, United Airlines is retiring their 747s within, <laughs> Crying. within a couple of weeks. I know, it's... Shoot, it's sad. It is. Uh, Queen of the Fleet, man. Have you flown on a whale before? I... About 10 years ago, I sat in first class. Uh, we used to fly it a lot domestically. Um, I think even in Chicago, Vegas, we would have a red-eye flight going back out of Vegas to Chicago, 47s or, um, or out of San Francisco. So it was nice. Um, but in the past 10 years, probably not. And sadly, I wanted to jump seat one of them before they kind of go bye-bye. And um, I don't think it's going to happen. You better hurry. Grab your passport. Yeah. Tell your wife, sorry, I'm going to, <laughs> going to Tokyo. I'll be yeah. back. Yeah, I would love to go. But, um, yeah, so, but what they did do, at least uh, at United, they uh, raffled off. So they had the 47 going out of all the hubs. Right. I saw and that. Then they, yeah, and they did a raffle for uh, some of the employees and, um, I think it was like 50 people per station, or maybe it was more, maybe it was 150. Anyway, um, 
to get an opportunity to ride the uh, 47 before they retired it. Um, and then they're doing, of course, the uh, San Francisco Honolulu, I believe it is. Yeah, I think you guys are doing, uh, United's doing that, what, November 7th? Kind of like just one last uh, farewell type of flight. It's going to be in the retro, um, what the first route on the 47 was. Okay. So, and I I was reading an article about it. They're going to have, like, the food that they originally had on that flight, and they're going to have the service, and the flight attendants are all going to dress on how they were dressed on that flight, you know, back on the first first time so it's, it seems like it's gonna be pretty neat that's a good deal i mean honestly that's uh uh i don't know i i really wish acme when we retire our 747s would do a hub to hub stuff or anything special and all that but i i really don't see that happening and there's nothing in the works for that happening i i, I keep trying to tell us i'm like you know if you put these things on hub to hubs or domestics or round robins like if if you fly the the 747 like atlanta minneapolis minneapolis atlanta like two or three times a day you'd sell every seat in a heartbeat oh yeah people would buy connections to get on that i mean you would fill the airplane absolutely i mean especially if you do it for a week and you advertise hey this is never flown on 747 this is the last week to do it on blah airline do it come i mean people would be would pour money out of their wallets when I'm, is I'm, uh one of them. retiring their 47s uh ours are retiring at the end of the year i think okay. december 31st honestly is the the last day okay but uh starting uh <clears throat> starting soon is uh the <clears throat> excuse me uh starting soon in I, I think like two or three days is the inaugural a uh, flight of their replacement aircraft from Detroit, Tokyo, and that'd be the the A three fifty. So, not the same. <laughs> not the same, but man, whew, not the same. But trust me, it works on a less. Uh, it's on a diet compared to yeah, the seven four seven. In a, uh, once they turn it on in the flight plan system, play with it. I literally took the same route, same day, and compared and contrasted in the A three fifty. 350 versus a 747 and it used literally half the fuel to get to tokyo at the same speed wow i mean you got two less engines you got a really sleek airplane it's lighter um it's carrying a couple of you know 50 less people but man it's it was the same speed and it climbed to cruise altitude so quickly like literally i think the initial altitude at that full payload capacity was 380 and it, you were at 40,000 feet by the Russian fur so any slot boundaries going into Russia you uh, you had that um, you know you, you, you get that guarantee that you were going to get your uh, optimal flight plan route uh, if you had to go through Russia very nice yes all right so our final our final um, news story comes uh, uh both from the uh, Aviation Herald, uh, globalnews.ca, which would be Canadian, and uh, we got some audio to play. But uh, this was an incident incident that happened on, do, 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 I think it was two days ago, on the 23rd, or that would be yesterday on the 23rd. An Air Canada A320 uh, was performing flight AC-781 from Montreal to San Francisco. Was on final approach to two eight right in San Francisco, and the crew reported on the tower was clear to land, and everything was normal. And then the previous, uh, pretty much, pretty much the previous arrival was supposed to roll down to Delta, but they got off on Tango. So now you had two airplanes stuck on Tango, which could have been blocking the runway. And then the uh, ATC, the San Francisco Tower. Then, uh, then said six times to the Air Canada Flight 781 to go around that they never did, and uh, and that was that. That's pretty much the end of this. And we have some audio for that, so let's go ahead and play uh, some audio. At least I had some audio. Let me uh, let me vamp and get the audio pulled up. Do, 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 do. 
I thought I had it nicely set up there, and I did not. So let me do this. Anytime you're told to go around, you usually just around. But I had you can always you can always go around, right? I think there's a podcast that has a great song that <laughs> yeah. we're playing right now about right, go around. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, obviously, I'm not a great podcast, and this isn't a great podcast. So <laughs> uh, we're getting there. Click here and pause there because I don't want to play it here. I want to copy it, and we'll play the unedited version over here in my Chrome browser, so you can hear it. Wow, there's a lot of button pushing over on this side. Woohoo. Kind of like kind of like flight planning. No, let's not suppose. I okay, let's listen to your ad. All right, one second. All right, we're skipping the ad. You playing it? There's no audio. No audio. All right, so, so, so obviously everyone in YouTube land can hear it. So I finally got it set. Let's try it this way.
Up with 4362 and 2706, runway one left, so take off, don't delay. One left, so take off, don't delay, top of 4362. Take 781, San Francisco Tower, 2706, runway 2 right, clear to land. Go on, 2 right, Aircon 781. South of 3117, go down to Delta, please, 12. All right. South of 3117, uh, yeah, use Tango there, hold short to 8 left. Tango, hold short to 8 left, South of 3117. Sorry, 9 at 384, 2 left. Yeah, 384, San Francisco, 2 left, 2 land, wind 2706. 2 8 left, clear land, yeah, 9 384. Air Canada 781, go around. 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 New Zealand 7 Heavy, contact North Cal departure. New Zealand 7 Heavy. Air Canada 781, go around. Hawaii 12 Heavy, turn left at Echo Ground, point 8. Echo Ground, 12 Heavy. United 2065, without delay, cross to left center ground, point 8. Without delay, please. Traffic company, two mile final, and they're fast. Yeah, we're, we're moving to the next point. Southwest 3117, pull all the way up to the hold bars, hold short, straight left. We'll do it, Southwest 3117, hold short, 24, straight left. Hey, 1736, straight left. Yeah, 1736, San Francisco Tower, wind 2706, runway 2 8 left, straight land. We're on 2 8 left, 1736. Air Canada 781, Tower. Air Canada 781, Tower. Air Canada 781, Tower. Yeah, Air Canada 781, the That's uh, pretty evident. Air Canada 781, <laughs> pull all the way up to the southwest. Get as close as you can and hold short of runway 28 left. Air Canada 781. That's like that. Close to the southwest here, Air Canada 781. Southwest 3117, cross to left ground, point 8. Cross to eight, left ground, point 8, southwest 3176. Air Canada 781, cross to eight, left, center ground, point 8. All right, 718, uh, cross 2 left, there, Council, thank you. Air Cam 781, taxi Bravo, there's a ramp. Bravo, ramp, Air Cam 781. Possible pilot deviation, have a number, let me know when you're ready. Anytime as you're flying, and you hear that comment from ATC, it says, hey, possible pilot deviation. I've got a number. Are you ready to copy? That's bad juju. <laughs> that's, that's something you never want to hear as a pilot. Well, they only told them, what, six times to go around. And you only six. Only six times, you know. And then how many times did they say contact tower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think it was a good eight times. So um, my guess is they accidentally hit the the, the radio the frequency switch button and go, oh, oh, oops, oh crap. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, when you look at the situation from the ATC controller, he now had two aircraft on the same, um, the same taxiway. And in San Francisco, the parallel runways aren't exactly wide. I mean, yeah. they're one airplane apart. I mean, they're only like a hundred. I don't know exactly, but I mean, you just, you can only fit one airplane on each taxiway and he had, they put him in there pretty tight. I mean, we've all seen the videos of seven, four sevens and seven, you know, E three twenties landing simultaneously almost on top of each other. Like, Oh my gosh, they're going to crash. Oh wait, they're on the different runways. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's bad. Uh, that's bad. Oops. Yeah. That could have been a pretty, uh, Disastrous. And last <clears throat> Air Canada seems like they're not having good luck in San Francisco. Yeah, I think they should just pull out. Don't fly yeah. San Francisco anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's pretty much all the San Francisco. We'll see what the fallout is on uh on that. And then uh you added you added a nails uh a new story. Uh talk <clears throat> about that. Yeah, just uh a little bit of a humorous one, I guess. Uh so this is from the uh, 
uh, out of Alaska Airlines, they had delayed a flight uh, because there was a seal on, on the runway. Um, so I guess that's kind of an, an ordinary to see a seal. Um, I guess this is out of Barrow, Alaska. Um, Alaska Airlines Flight 55, uh, they canceled their clearance and delayed the flight because they had to get the seal off the runway. And uh, if you click on the link, it'll, I will put it in the show notes, but there's actually a video of the... Um, seal just sitting there and they get a close-up view of the seal like just like staring around like the deer in the headlights not knowing what to do where to go um they did get uh from what it looks like here they did try to uh there's a quote here that uh they tried poking it a few times with a big <laughs> wrench and the seal loved that uh so i guess what they yeah they got into the safety area and the local polar bear control guys came over with a snow machine and sled and rode it away from <laughs> south back to blowing snow so. you know if, if if they didn't get the polar bears off the airport the seals wouldn't be there right i mean wow yeah. I mean, I mean, it, 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 to anyone that doesn't know, we're not talking about like some seal, like some caulking or yeah, some no. sealing off the runway. We're talking about the mammal, the seal that, you know, <laughs> this, this poor dude sitting there with a snow beard sitting on right around the thousand foot yeah. markers. It looks like just chilling on the runway because probably the runway is warm. Yeah. And, you know. You get elk in like in certain like in the high mountain airports. Sometimes you'll see, you know, in the notums, caution elk on runway or or <laughs> or, uh, you know, even at O'Hare sometimes. I mean, it's not uncommon to get deer on the runway in the early morning hours. Um, you know, they'll they'll have to like rearrange all the runways because there's a pack of deer on there. It's like, you know, doesn't uh, doesn't O'Hare use goats? to mow the grass in the summertime goats uh, one of the major air airports i know it's not atlanta but i'm pretty sure it's chicago here they have a flock of goats that come out and uh eat the grass instead of mowing the grass <laughs> they eat goats um but you, you know, know what the city of Chicago is broke, so I wouldn't be surprised if they did use goats to fly. They don't want to pay their labor, so. <laughs> so that would be a cheap and efficient way to cut the grass. So I'm not yeah. ruling that out. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is pretty, pretty cheap. Um, it's cheap labor. Yeah, I mean, but anytime you got anything on the runway. Um, what, one other time was I used to work the Africa desk and you couldn't get anyone in the world to to work the Africa desk for you. Um, geez, you know, you'd have weird things happen and you have to divert because I don't know, there's like a caribou on the runway or something. So I, I try to send out a swap request and I'm like, hey, trying to swap off this desk. I understand that no one ever wants it. And I attached a picture a, uh, in Africa of a 172 that <laughs> hit, hit a giraffe and killed oh. and broke the giraffe's neck. And it was a crack. So there was a picture of a mangled 172 with the dead giraffe on the runway behind it. And I'm like, so if you really don't want the swap that I'm offering, at least you can laugh at the picture. And yeah, I, <laughs> I, I recall a couple of years ago seeing that picture. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> I, mean it's, I mean, it's one of those things like, I don't know, when you're trying to trying to swap off a desk that's horrible and no one ever wants to work that you have to do something, you know, to try to entice them. Yeah. And for me, it was at that time, it was sending a picture of a Cessna 172 and a dead giraffe on a runway. Notum airport closed, dead giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's pretty much going to wrap up the news. Let's uh, move on to the topic. All right, Greg, so you uh, found an article online. You posted on your personal Facebook page, and you sent it to me. And so why don't you go ahead and explain uh, the article that's kind of the driver behind of this week's topic. 
Okay, so the article that I have is out of Forbes, um, October 9th, and it's just an article that's it's titled, Imagine Life Without Meteorologists. It's hard. Um, and you can look at this two sides. Some people like, oh, those meteorologists are always wrong. They don't know what they're doing, you know, and then there's the other people who are like, God, thank God we have meteorologists because how would we predict these hurricanes and thunderstorms and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the article kind of goes into depth about, you know, what they, they surveyed uh, people and asked them how it, they'll ask the audience, how is your daily or weekly forecast made? And people come up with, oh, they use satellites and radars and, oh, they just look at things and it moves from west to east or they look at past conditions that were similar and they just make a forecast. They look at the average conditions on a given day and just make a forecast. And, um, you know, as we all know in the aviation industry, it's not that easy. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not a professional meteorologist. I am a meteorologist by, or I'm a weather enthusiast by hobby. I'm a weather nerd. Um, and I thank our meteorologists around here because, I mean, I, I give them credit for being able to, you know, just look at the given, look at all the, you know, all the models and be able to come up with a, a forecast and say, here's what's going to happen. And 95% of the time, they are pretty close to being accurate. I mean, you do get the eyeball times where, you know, they'll say, oh, it's going to be, you know, sunny and it winds up being raining and we get a thunderstorm or whatnot. Um or a snowstorm that never happens, you know? So, um, you know, well, so it's it a got... snowstorm that never happens because the freezing line went 10 miles to the north. Right. Exactly. I mean, and 10 miles to the north, it got three feet of snow, but it was only rain at the airport. I mean, I mean, right. meteorology, unexact, right. un, unexact science. And some people, a lot of people, in fact, you know, if it doesn't rain over their head or over their house, then the forecast is wrong. And whereas, like you said, 10 miles away, they could have got a major storm or a snow, you know, snowstorm or whatnot. And everyone's looking for that. The weatherman says it's going to rain. By golly, I better get a rainstorm. Or if they say it's going to be sunny, I want that sun. And if they're wrong, God, those weathermen are always wrong. They're always getting, you know, a bad rap for the forecast that may or may not happen, right? Right. So it got me thinking, you know, looking at this article and thinking about what we do every day in aviation in terms of our jobs as dispatching and how we directly work with the meteorologists within our airlines. And it makes me think, okay, what would happen if we didn't have a meteorology department within our airline? How would we go about planning our flights um you know with flights we're looking at weather thunderstorms snowstorms it goes into fuel it goes into alternates you know we trust our meteorologists to provide us accurate information and you know thinking about it like if you didn't have a meteorologist as dispatchers when we go through training we are trained meteorology the basics of course we're not getting our degree in it, but um, we have to know how to read a, a surface chart, how to read a pressure chart, how to read lifted index, um, all the different things a meteorologist has to look at. So in a way, we're like little pseudo meteorologists. Wouldn't you agree? I, I would absolutely agree. Yeah. And, and not just dispatching, pilots too. A pilots, when they're doing their self-briefing, they're going through the same brief things that we're looking at. They're looking at everything from surface all the way on up. And we have to be able to interpret that and convey the message to the pilots to let them know, to make sure we're all on the same page. So, um, yeah, so I, I encourage everyone to read this article. We'll put it out on the show notes, but... Uh, Mike and I just wanted to kind of talk about maybe some of the weather products that we use in aviation and um, to, and our thought process when we're flight planning to come up with the weather, the fuel, and if we need an alternate or not, and that kind of stuff. All right. So why don't you start? What products uh, uh, do you use? What, do you, what are your go-to places? So in my airline, we have a – 
we have a uh, a company, a third party company that does our weather for us. It's through the weather company, which used to be WSI, um, and they are our primary source of weather and the National Weather Service as our backup. So when I look, when I sign in, my first things that I look at, of course, I have to look at our our weather company tasks for all the locations that we're flying to sh and all our hubs. And I'll compare those to the National Weather Service TAF just to kind of see if they're the same. Sometimes they're quite different. You know, one TAF will say thunderstorms and the other one says nothing about thunderstorms. So, you know, you start getting a little bit of disparity, then you have to do some more digging. Um, so I will always, first things I look at are, um, a surface analysis chart. I always want to know what's going on at the surface because that's where our airports are on the ground. So do we have a cold front? Do we have a warm front? Do we have a stalled out front? Um, and then I layer myself up. So, okay, look at the surface, what's going on down there. Then I'm going to look at the uh, mid layer, the 500 millibar charts and all the way up to the jet stream, which is usually at the, uh, 250 millibar because you got to get a good picture of what's going on in the atmosphere to accurately plan your flights. Um, so WSI has their own charts and then I'm going to compare those with uh, the government. And for those of you who are not um, familiar with the website, aviationweather.gov is my best friend. Um, if you haven't been on there, I highly recommend you to go on there. Uh, there's so much information on there that you could pull up for briefing. Um, you could pull up all your TAFs, your METARs. Um, you could pull up your, uh, your jet stream analysis, uh, thunderstorm outlooks. And they just actually put out a new product that I religiously use. It's called the, uh, the GF, GFA tool, which stands for Graphical forecast. Now, Mike, I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the um, GFA tool is actually replacing the area forecast yes, that most yes. of the general aviation pilots use. I have not dabbled into the GFA yet, but I am. The, I, it's the only forecast that gives you cloud tops. And as a GA pilot, that you know the the bases and the tops are the big thing. You know, can I go VFR and top at five thousand feet? Or am I going to be in the soup all the way through 15,000 feet where my airplane can't get to? So I know the, the GFA is something that's rather new. It is. It, in fact, the other day, it caught me by surprise because I would always, I shouldn't say I always look at the um, area forecasts, but when there's thunderstorms in the area, I kind of want to get an idea. So the other day I went in there to pull it up and it said, it's gone. I'm like, I freaked out a little bit. I'm like, because uh, I, you know, it, it was a tool to have. But now looking at this GFA, it's actually pretty handy because um, all within one chart, you can look at your icing, your turbulence, your winds, your thunderstorms, their cloud layers, your base, your tops. And that's handy with thunderstorms, like you had mentioned. And, and your ceilings and your visibility, whether they're IFR or VFR. Um, and the one thing I use it a lot for is PIREPS because while we have our own um, ASD, we use Flight Explorer we're, we're at, at my airline. You could overlay your um, PIREPS on there, um, but there's not a whole lot of functionality to filter it. Like if I just want to see within the last hour or last 30 minutes, I, I think there is a way to do it on there, but it's not as easy with this product here. You can make your pyrops huge for the blind like myself, um, <laughs> you know, and you can make it within, you know, I only want to see pyrops within the last 60 minutes. And I will display on the on the screen of all your pyrops and I, I it's very user friendly. So I've been using this more and more just to kind of get some good situational awareness um, within the within, you know, where we're flying. It only works domestically right now, and I think they are trying to expand this um, more internationally, or so they said. But, um, but as you were talking, I'm kind of playing around with the GFA, and it, it's it's decent. It's pretty fun, um, but it I don't. Know, 
maybe there's something about me that's old school that kind of likes just i don't know reading the central georgia northern illinois forecast and that is it really that hard to see a paragraph that says this is what the weather is in this area i mean looking at the gfa yeah for, from an airliner point of view the gfa is great because it gives you such a broad area to look at you can look at the whole continuous united states you can see all the all the things going on there but you know from a guy that wants to fly 50 miles between this area and this area here i don't need to see this just give me a sentence about what's going to happen here and i'll be that dumb and happy yeah i think we've i think they're going more and you see more and more products where they're going away with text they want to make everything dummy down for people um, because people don't want to read. But and you, like you said, the old school people like you and myself, we like to read. We like to see. I used to print out at the beginning of my shift, all my METARs and people think I kill trees all the time at work. They make fun of me, <laughs> but I print out, I print out my tasks, my METARs, the forecast discussions with this. You can't do any of that. I mean, it's all in here. Um, but I think the newer generation, they don't really, people don't want to read. They just want to see pictures. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much exactly what it is. They, they just want to see pictures. Right. Pictures, they say, are a million words. So, um, you know, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but I like this tool. I think it's actually um, pretty handy. So I'll compare this a lot with what our um, in-house or WSI puts out. And usually they're... Um, pretty close but um and we have the authority using e-winds to use whatever meteorology source we want to use yeah we, um, do. we do as well yeah so they just want us to use you know uh, for our own hubs to use our in-house type stuff for alternate planning and all that kind of stuff um, for tasks but um uh so yeah it, so i'll use this and i'll also on those weather forecast crummy days when there's thunderstorms, the Storm Prediction Center has a pretty good website. You can go on there. Um, that's at spc.gov. And you can look at all the the outlooks on there. They break it down to four-hour um, increments. And you can look at, okay, what is the probability of thunderstorms occurring over a certain location? And um, so for route planning, if you see that there's a, a thunderstorm that may occur over the Midwest somewhere, It'll say, okay, 10%, 20%. Okay, well, there's a pretty good chance of a thunderstorm. Oh, see, I'm falling here again. <laughs> <laughs> for those that don't, for those of you don't, that don't know, I'm using my iPad today because I made a dumb mistake and don't have a charger for my laptop. <laughs> so hey, that's why you see me keep falling here. Um, anyway, so yeah, for route planning purposes, SPC is very good it, it outlining where thunderstorms are and, um, I say 95% of the time, it's pretty close to being accurate. Um, so between that, the government tasks, I, I really think that there's some really neat tools out there. And every day there's more and more neat websites coming out. There's a new one that came out that someone showed me the other day. I, I should, it's called Windy TK, I think it is. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the website will, it'll, it's a graphical um, it'll show you where all the winds are. Like it'll flow where the winds are in the core of the jet stream. It actually moves in like a 3D, um, 3D. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Or if, no, I, I, haven't. I, I haven't. I, yeah, it's really neat because then you can actually see, okay, you could overlay a route on there and you could see, okay, you're going to be flying right into the core of the jet stream. And this website shows the direction of the winds proportionate to your flight plan in a moving 3d display so it'll it's it'll tell you okay at this point you're going to be hitting 95 mile per hour winds coming directly at you you know you could kind of route a little bit different way just based on how that website works it's really neat you'd have to kind of see it in order to, i'll see if i can try to find the link and uh, send it to you but uh yeah so so it's really there's some really neat stuff out there if if you're an AV geek and weather and like me, I just play around all this and this kind of stuff all day. 
Um, thankfully at Acme, uh, from my perspective, we still have an in-house meteorologist that are 100% Acme employees. I mean, I think there's six, nine, I think there's 10 or 12 of them, you know, rotating shifts and they will do, uh, they write our own tafts for <laughs> Craig fell over again. <laughs> Stop. I can't move. Um, hey. They they write our own tafts, um, and that uh, for the the major cities, I think they do about twelve tafts um, at the regular taft intervals. And with uh, John Michael's Cub Scout group, we actually went down to the National Weather Service, and ACME actually sends their taft to the Atlanta National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service guy gets the ACME taft, and he gets the his own TAF and you know, they can kind of compare each other and all that. And it's kind of funny as, as dispatchers, we do the same thing because when we, when we put in our system, you know, pull up the TAF, we'll get the, we'll get the Acme TAF and then right below it, we'll get the national weather service TAF. And so we sit there and go, why why are we saying thunderstorms? And they're saying clear, (laughs) which one of these guys is right. Or even still like when I was a dispatcher at a, a distinct moment in my career, a dispatcher at a at the regional level. So I've been there like maybe three or four months. I show up at three in the morning, start releasing my flights to Detroit because Detroit was a, a big hub for me in, on that desk. And there's a line of thunderstorms just coming on to Michigan from from Lake Michigan into Michigan. And they're literally marching towards Detroit. And the forecast is greater than six sky clear. And I'm like, Something is not making sense here. Screw it. We're going to throw an alternate on because I got 60 releases to do in the next 10 minutes. And yeah. we're just going to pound some flights out. And we're freaking throwing Cleveland on. We're going to put, throw some gas on it. And the mainline dispatchers obviously didn't do that. And somewhere three or four hours later, shocking, the line of thunderstorms smacked through the hub and all the mainline flights diverted and all of my flights held got in no issues i mean it's i mean as a dispatch you have to take all the meteorologist stuff you have to take all these sources together throw it all in a big pot of soup and then make your decision from that uh but for me so i'm very lucky we have our 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 meteorology department that we can go to they produce upper air forecasts for us they produce surf- the surface analysis forecast they produce tafts for us uh if you need a TAF for a specific station or if you uh think that the TAF that the national weather service for some country produced isn't exactly accurate because you don't agree with it and you want them to take a look at it they'll take a peek at it uh and things like that um so we do that, and then for for Acme, we have uh, switched over to uh, uh, WSI Fusion as our ASD, and we're able to throw all of the Acme meteorology products onto Fusion. So I pretty much have a one-stop shop where if I want to go into meteorology products and stuff, I will look directly onto onto Fusion itself. And I'll pull up up the Acme products, and I'll want to look at the Acme products. I can look at the National Products, uh, National Weather Service products, exactly on the same screen, and I can see everything as we go. So, for me, I pretty much have a a, a one stop shop. Um, that GFA tool that you talked about, that's that's pretty cool. I'm pretty much going to use that for my uh, uh, for my general aviation flying. But uh, for the GA flying, I pretty much go to Four Flight because Four Flight pretty much regurgitates all the national weather stuff uh, onto my iPad, and I go I go there for, for there for that. So it's funny you, you so Fusion. We are um, from what I understand, we are going to be going with that product um, starting next year. Um, the program we use, Flight Explorer, it, you know, it, it does a lot of the same stuff that I think Fusion does. Um, flight Explorer is a Saber product, which we use Saber for our flight planning. So they work hand in hand well together, but right. we also use, like I mentioned, the weather company, but the weather company and 
Flight Explorer don't integrate very well because they're two different products. Whereas if we go to Fusion, the flight company and Fusion integrate the perfectly because the same company. Exactly. So there's a lot of neat functionality that we have seen with Fusion that we do not have the capability of with Flight Explorer. So, um, so I'm excited to see that come across. I mean, there. I, I like the ability to layer different, and, and we can do some of that to an extent in Flight Explorer. I mean, we could put whatever you want on there, but I've seen with Fusion, it's just a little bit more user friendly, and um, I'm excited to see that come across. Yeah, there, I mean, with Fusion, there's some stuff that we've lost from our old in-house product that was very useful, but all in all, I I like Fusion. It works well. Yeah, it's a it's a good product. I saw a demo of it over at uh, when we were at ADF yeah. and they, they had the vendor there showing it off and he's talking, you know, it, it's, it's really neat. And, and, and I think my opinion here, I think it's a lot quicker to integrate the products. Um, whereas with flight for when they, they only, I mean, radar is radar. It updates every five minutes or something like that. But, um, but the other products that load in there, it could be 10, it could be 15 minutes before you get an update. And when you're talking about airplanes that are driving five, 600 miles an hour, you want products that are going to update every two minutes, ideally, or three minutes, you know? Right. You don't want to be sitting there and waiting, waiting. Yeah. Um, but also to your point that you had mentioned about how you see the conflict in the forecast, you know, you get your, your in-house meteorologist will come up with a TAF, right, for Cleveland or whatever, and you get your National Weather Service TAF, or one will say thunderstorms and whatnot, and the other one's completely conflicting. And I'm looking at, you know, I sit there and I try to analyze, like, what is, why are there two yeah. different forecasts here? So, you know, then then I do my own digging, like I mentioned, and be like, okay, looking at the models here, there's going to be a line of thunderstorms that's going to plow right over the airport at this time. I'm putting an alternate on there because I don't yeah. trust this forecast. I, I mean, for us, I mean, we're thankful enough to have the ability to go over there and say, what the heck are you smoking? What do you, or I've gone over the meteorologist to say, hey, you wrote this TAF. What are you thinking? And obviously, you can see their forecast. What do you see that's different? And, right. you know, you can, we have that interaction. We can go with them and say, hey, what, what's the deal? Huh? I, I don't get it. And a lot of times they'll either explain it and you'll buy it. Or a lot of times you're like, yeah, okay. I'm going to throw some gas yeah. on. Thanks. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we have our w our weather people in the office too, where we can go over there and ask them. And, you know, sometimes they'll give you an explanation. Other times it's like, I think sometimes it's a dartboard methodology. They throw a dart wherever it lands. That's what the, the forecast <laughs> is going to be. I mean, <laughs> that's the joke around the office say which where did the dart land today you know i mean you're you're lucky you're going to start international training on the pacific uh, on the atlantic theater compared to the pacific theater uh because the russian forecasts on the pacific rim are always uh a quarter mile in the vv of 200 every day really? every single day they're calling for socked in fog and thankfully, we have meteorologists to say, yeah, yeah, nope, this is what the real forecast is. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, it's great. That's just common, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Every... by, by the way, it's on the chat room, I posted the website. It's windy.com, W-I-N-D-Y, okay. um, for that website I was talking about where it shows the uh, the winds and the jet stream and all that. And it's, I love it. It's, it's And I think they just put an app out for the iPad, too, so you can... Overlay, overload the uh, the winds on there and all that. So for for my personal use, I like uh, my radar as an app. My radar. Yeah, it's a good app. It does the same yeah. thing. It kind of shows the flow of the winds and things like that. I think I've seen that. I I I, I use radar scope a lot. Um, I don't fly, so I mean, I you know, although I'd like to, but. For my own purposes, I'll use radar scope, but I've heard about my radar as a pretty good, uh, pretty good website. It's okay. It's okay that you don't fly. We forgive you. I'd like to. I'm. I'm. You know. I'm. I, I've got a whole four hours logged. You know. <laughs> and that was ten years. That was ten years ago before I actually no fifteen years ago before I had kids. So 
<laughs> kids. You know, it's kids kind of took over my life and my financial system. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I will one right. day. One day. Let's go ahead and move on. You, anything else you want to talk about weather wise? No, you, no, not. I mean, I just kind of wanted to talk about that article and how, you know, weather is weather and just how it kind of relates to aviation. So those are the heavy hits to, that I wanted to pass along. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the life portion of the show. All right, Greg, what's been up with you the last uh, week and a half? Last week and a half. Well, I've been in a state of depression. My Chicago Cubs got eliminated in the uh, championship series. They got beat by the Dodgers. So I've been walking around sulking all the time because I have to wait till April to see them play again. (laughs) Honestly, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been that, uh, I was a lot calmer this year than I was last year. And I'm not like, Oh my gosh, they're great. We blew it again. It's like, okay, we lost no big deal. Let's do it again next year. Just wait till next year. You know, but that's the but, that's the slogan of the Cubs. You wait till next but, year. But, but see, it's not. See, I saw somewhere online. It was like, hey, remember last year? What instead of wait till next year? Remember last year? I mean, maybe I'm still on that high of holy cow. The Cubs won the World Series. Yeah, and I mean, to to be honest, I didn't think the Cubs were that good this year as they were no, last year. No, and no, I, they I were. They, they made next, it to where they got to. And that's, right. that's pretty much all there was. That's all right. Next year's the year. Um, so aside from that, you know, it's been uh, my stepdaughter turned 14. We just had a uh, birthday party for her the other day. And, uh, you know, she's moving along in those teenage years, which are tough years to deal with. Um, <laughs> and I got uh, my other son, my son, who is going to be 15 in January. So it's just, he's going to be driving soon. So I'm trying to get myself mentally in, you know, prepared for that whole thing. Um, life moves quick. You know, you just, you, you know, you stop and you think about how fast these kids grow up and it's amazing. You know? Yeah. Here's um, a pro tip for teaching a kid how to drive in the snow. And my dad did, did this with me. That's why I call it a pro tip because it was his idea. Uh, the first day it snowed and there was a decent amount of snow on the ground. He took me to the church parking lot and it was empty and we did donuts. <laughs> and that's how I taught my wife how to drive in the snow where I take her. I took her to the same per, church per, parking lot and I pulled the parking brake on her and I kept on pulling it until she was able to keep it straight and recover from the skid or the slide. That's, that's actually and a good way to learn. Yeah, it, it's pretty much the only way to learn and and now when i get snow, I, it's been a while since i get snow uh obviously to drive in the snow down here in georgia <laughs> but when i go back up north and drive the slows driving in snow was a lot like flying in turbulence because all of a sudden out of nowhere you get whoa or e, yeah. you know you you get you get something changed and you have to correct for it so to me driving in snow and flying in turbulence is a lot a lot similar yeah, well, it's gonna be some tough times, but it, it but it's good that he's gonna learn in the winter. I'd rather him start driving in the winter to kind of help him learn how to, because that is the hardest time to drive. If you can drive in snow, I think you can deal with with that or anything. Right. Um. So yeah, that's that's. Uh, I start international training in two weeks, so looking forward to that. E tops. E tops and adequate. You're you're gonna learn quickly different difference between suitable and adequate airports. Big Guarantee difference. it. I'm I'm not gonna spoil it for you. <laughs> now you have something. Look, I just gave you two vocab words that you already know about. Well, that's good because on top of me studying my international stuff, I've also got my yearly comp check coming up in two weeks three weeks 
So I've got to start going over all my domestic stuff and, you know, st whole study guide for that. I don't know if you guys do that at your era, uh, but. are you are your comp checks that difficult Oh, yeah. They're an eight hour waterboarding session. Wow Yeah. I wish we had an eight hour waterboarding session They sit with you for two hours at the desk to see, okay, do you know how to dispatch? That's the easy part. You know, okay, you know how to dispatch, you know how to release a flight. Then you go into the back, and they basically, you go through scenarios, and they question you on every policy that they can think of. Okay, what is the fuel policy? What are the, what are the drift town altitudes if a 737 loses an engine over the Rockies? You have to be able to find all that in the DOM, and they time you. And then there's certain memorization items that you have to know. I mean, it's no joke. And it's it's a good eight-hour day every year going through all that stuff. So I have to – you do. You have to literally study all this stuff because this is not stuff you do all the time, you know? Wow. I'm glad I didn't put an application in for Acting <laughs> North that's currently hiring. Shoot. Man, that's I, hard. I mean, it's good because it makes you think – you know, go back and think about all this stuff. But at the same time, it's like you get so worked up and you get so nervous for this day because you just know that it's going to just be a long day. And some people, it takes 10 hours. I mean, you're there 10 hours wow. to get through all this stuff. So so between wow. international and my studying for my comp check, yeah, I'm going to be busy the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Sucks for you. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> well, let's see. All right, let's talk about me. So on what day was it? What day did we go flying? The other day, I think it was on Sunday. Uh we went flying. I had the day off. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think it was Sunday. I had the day off. Or maybe Saturday. I had the day anyway. Saturday or Sunday, someday this weekend. Well uh it was Saturday. We had the day off and it was early in the morning. I texted um my wife's aunt and uncle live up on the north side of Atlanta, and it was a gorgeous day. So I'm like, hey, I want to go fly. And I told Naomi, I'm like, hey, the airplane's about to go down for an annual. The um, airport's going to be closed for two weeks starting, like, November 5th. So we're going to have a good solid three or four weeks where we can't go flying. So you want to go flying. And so we went flying, and we met her aunt and uncle up at our uh, airport up on the north side and had dinner there and it was great gorgeous day flying but naomi uh recorded uh maria sophia the baby uh who's 15 months now her her face on takeoff and it's been five months she's gone flying on the little airplane and it was so exciting i mean she's sitting in her mom's lap in in the back i'm flying victor's sitting next to me so i got the middle child next to me uh, the oldest child is back behind, uh, behind um, uh, Naomi, and she's recording, looking out the window, and, and her face is so excited, and she's pointing at the window, and then, and then we take off, and her face goes from like happy go lucky to serious, <laughs> and like you can try to see the gears in her head, try to put it all together, like she's sitting there go, trying to go, in, huh, what? Whoa. I mean, and like she was tapping her finger on the window. I saw and that, once we yeah. took off, like she tapped like two more times and then it then it stuck. And she's like, it was it was awesome. She was trying to figure it out. It was really, really trying to figure out everything. Um, so we fly up there. Um it's kind of funny thing, and a really interesting thing that I had um I had to fly through a class D airport uh, to get to uh, to get to the airport we we're going to. And so I check out with them. Class D established two way communications get cleared through the airspace. Away we go. And where I was and I check in and say the controller goes, well, where you are, you can pretty much go direct to there and you can avoid our airspace. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I see two TFRs over the city for the two college football games that are going on this evening, so I kind of need to go around. He goes, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like it's like one of those things. If I didn't have my pre-flight planning done and didn't do all the stuff prior to 
for me, it would have been like, oh, oh, jailbait. I mean, it's like, here, here, why don't you go just go direct? No, I can't go direct. Freaking Georgia Tech's going to start playing in an hour and a half. Sorry. I'd love to. I'd love to cut that corner, but I got to kind of go further north. Wow. Um, so that was fun. And then uh, had dinner. Uh, actually, we get there, and then we actually beat her aunt and uncle to dinner, which is kind of funny. They're like maybe 10 miles away by car, and we're flying there so we beat them there and then as we're taxiing in and taxiing to the ramp where we're going to park the uh we noticed there's a park there at the airport and the airport we uh landed at was uh peach street to cab which is the second busiest airport in the state of georgia obviously the busiest airport in the state of georgia is atlanta hartsfield jackson so i mean this airport takes g5s to beach musketeers and everything in between and so it's basically the general aviation airport for the city of atlanta and they have a park they had an observation area they had a, a little pavilion in the shape of a hangar with bathrooms for uh people to rent out all in all it was a really great place so we hung out there the kids played and it just happens that one of my uh co-workers just happened to be there with her kid <laughs> so it, it was kind of a cool thing um had dinner which was great because dinner uh the restaurant is up on the second floor and they uh it overlooks the runways and everything so we sat there watching jets land and take off and by jets i mean like challenger 600s and if you don't know what a challenger 600 is that's a crj 200 with a lot less seats um that, that performs a lot better and everything like that so uh that was uh that was fun. And then on the great thing on the way home, we switched and John Michael sat next to me. Victor was in back. So pretty much any time I fly somewhere with both boys, I, I switch off. I fly somewhere and flop the kids halfway. And then on the way back, John Michael had the controls, obviously with me in my hands very closely watching. But John Michael flew us almost all the way home. And it was it was really cool to have your son who's 10 fly the airplane all the way home and he was keeping his heading pretty much well we were all that and Naomi in the back was starting to freak out every time like he turned like oh we're turning I'm like we're fine he's doing a good job and then he'd start climbing like hey bud you're climbing you're 100 feet too high and instead of being gentle with it he'd go whoosh (laughs) and just (laughs) shove the yoke forward and I'm like no gentle you have to be gentle with everything your your mom doesn't like those sinking feeling in her stomach like the rest of us do you have to be gentle when you have passengers so um that was fun that was a that was a really good time and then uh sunday night i picked up a shift of overtime it's supposed to be a one night stand and then at three o'clock on monday i got a phone call for uh to come in again ask if I want to come into work again, that'd be for double time. And anytime work comes in for double time, you, you don't say no. So you go, you go, you go. go. (laughs) Anytime that meter is running at double time speed, you just, uh, you just run in there. So, um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. I thought there was one more other thing I want to talk about, but eh, anyway, I got a, a great APG, um, uh, this won't. This episode won't be out before then. But uh, on Friday, I'm meeting up with uh, Captain Jeff from Airline Pilot Guy, David Abbey, who's down here in Atlanta from New York, and a bunch of other people at a uh, a local pub near the Atlanta restaurant, uh, Atlanta Airport, uh, just off Virginia Avenue. So I got that. And then Friday, I've got international recurrent training, uh, international dispatch recurrent training. I'm going to go to and uh, see that. And it, at my airline, dispatchers, literally, once you're international, you're supposed to know the whole world and everything about it. So we're not segregated by theaters. We're we're pretty much a, a one-stop show. So I always like international. It's pretty much usually good information yeah. to go to. Yeah, so, something to look forward to. Absolutely. So that's going to wrap it up. Unless you have anything else to add. 
No, nothing else on my end. I'm just going to stay warm and, uh, you know, until our next episode, hopefully we don't have any snow. <laughs> Winter's coming. Winter's coming. Yeah, you guys are hosed. <laughs> Thanks I'll for... Uh, um, yeah. I'll be up there before the next episode. Maybe, maybe, maybe just beforehand, I'll be up there for the... The Bears Packer game November twelfth, and hopefully it's not freezing, and hopefully I'm not cold, and hopefully I drink enough whiskey in the Sky Club in the airplane before I get up there to uh, keep myself warm. Well, if I happen to snag a ticket to the game, I'll let you know. All right, sounds good. All right, so that's gonna that's gonna wrap it up. So I'm gonna play this, and then I'm gonna read this. Oh, page. Patreon. If you uh, want to be a supporter of our show, uh, click on the link for Patreon. Uh, Patreon, we use those funds. Trust me, we don't get rich off of your contributions. Nowhere near. Uh, pretty much when you run a podcast, you got to pay for web hosting. You have to pay for uh, uh, web hosting and media hosting. So uh, turn that down a bit. So if you, you have extra money, but if you're shoot, if you're poor, if you are uh, if you're tra- playing for flight training or anything like that, dispatch school, don't. Please don't. Keep your money. But if, uh, you, if you're a millionaire, you got extra bucks sitting around, feel free. If you're a top dollar dispatcher in another different major airline, trust me, I know how much you guys make. Um, <laughs> feel free to throw us a couple of bucks an episode. Um, all that. Uh, you can find show notes for this episode at blindlife.com slash 2017 slash 29. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Flying in Life, Facebook.com slash Flying in Life, and Instagram at Flying in Life. Greg, what about you online? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Greg Dubin or um, on Twitter. Actually, I'm coming up with a new Twitter handle, but for now, it's WXFan1978. Ooh, a new Twitter handle. That'll be exciting. Yeah, so to be continued, I'll let you know. All right, so that's going to wrap it up. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, anything you want us to talk about, show ideas, why, why do you dispatchers do this? I was flying this one time, and this happened to my flight. Why do you think why did it happen? You can send that to contact at flyinglife.com. We'll definitely look at that. Hopefully, the closing music from bensound.com and bumper music from purpleplanet.com. And you can also find this po- fine podcast not only on iTunes, but also on Stitcher. So. Until the next time, have a good one, everybody. Good night. Thanks for listening. Woo-hoo. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. Another one in the books. Man, I need to pee. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to go to bed. I got to be up at three. Well, Shit, you got to go to bed? Well, I normally go to bed around this time anyway. So oh, 10, 11 shit. o'clock. Brad, but I, get I, up, I get up I get up. I get up at 3.30 in the morning. So. All righty. All right, man. It's fun. We'll do it again. Absolutely. Next- all right, have a good night. Get some rest and go pee. All right, we'll do, Brian. Ciao. Later. See ya. Bye.